CPM included the ability to run a command line when it booted, but utilizing that was not very user friendly, nor was it very well documented. So the typical end user of CPM didn't take advantage of this feature, may not have even known about it for that matter. But we're going to change all that in this video. We're going to show you exactly how to use the auto run ability in um, CPM. We're going to do it here on an Altair 8800 running CPM. Let's go ahead and fire up the machine, give it a hard reset. I'm going to set the load address to the boot ROMs, which is at 177400. We examine that to set the PC, hit run. We get some good blinking lights for a minute, and then we're up and running. So let me uh, zoom in on this a bit. All right, so there's our prompt. Now on this disk, I've got a program I wrote called Welcome, right there. We're going to use that as the program we automatically run. So when Welcome runs, it just says Auto Run Work. That's all it does. All right, so we're going to make that be the Auto Run program. Now in order to make CPM automatically run a command line, you actually have to patch CPM on the boot sectors out on the floppy and there is no utility for making that easy. So like I said, it's not very user friendly. But it can be done with a few standard CPM utilities and let's go ahead and demonstrate how to do that. All right, first we're going to run move CPM. Move CPM is used to create a clean copy of CPM down at a standard address in low memory. Now when we provide the move CPM command with no options, that means make a CPM that is the right configuration for the amount of RAM in this system. And now sitting in memory is a copy of CPM down at a fixed low address that we can now work with. The options are to run sysgen, which is what you would typically do, that writes it out to a disk. Or in our case, we don't want to write it out, we want to change it first, so we're going to use the second option, which is to actually just save it as a file. Um, it's not saving it to the boot area on the disk, it's just a whole other file out there. So we'll save 38 CPM. We can call it anything we want, so I'll call it CPM.com. Now the 38 is how many pages of memory to write out to this file. There are 256 byte pages that we're writing out. Alright, so now we've saved that memory image. and We can run the debugger, which is DDT. That's going to load that right back into memory. But now with the debugger in place, we can actually change this. Now you might wonder, why don't you just run the debugger while it was already in memory? And the reason is because the process of running the debugger would have clobbered some of the memory um, and therefore rendered it useless. So what happens is when you run DDT, it loads itself into memory or CPM loads it, it then relocates itself into high memory, pulls in the CPM image we saved, which is now um, nice and clean in memory. So now we can take a look at it and manipulate it as we need. All right, the uh, part of CPM we have to modify is actually the command and control processor. It's at the very front lowest addresses of uh, CPM in memory as it sits right now. And that's typically at A100 or A80 in our case. Let me dump that address uh, in memory. Now it might be at 980, A100, A80 as we see here. One of those three is typically where it would be on any given system. Now on this version of CPM, it'll always be at A80. And you can instantly recognize you've got the right spot by seeing the copyright notice over here. Now at this position is the start of the command processor. First six bytes are two jump instructions, one there, one here. We'll get to those in just a minute. The next bytes are actually the input buffer used by the command processor during normal CPM operations. So everything you type ends up going into this command buffer right here. The first byte tells us how many total bytes are available in the buffer, 127 maximum. The next byte is how many were entered on the most recent command. This shows zero, meaning you haven't typed in anything yet. So the rest of this buffer is basically just garbage. Now obviously they've initialized it with a copyright notice, but as you type commands it would overwrite that copyright notice. What we want to do is change this to our welcome program. So we want seven in here for the length, because that would be how long of the characters you typed. And then we want the word welcome in there. So let's go ahead and use the set command at A87 to change these things. All right, instead of zero bytes, we want seven. And now we want the word welcome. Now, unfortunately, we can't type that in ASCII. We have to type in the hex for it. But I've already looked that up. So W is a 57, E is 45, L is 40C, uh, 4C. Um, C is a 43, F is 4F, 
excuse me, that's an O. M is 4D and E is 45. And we want to terminate this with a trailing null. All right, so now if we dump this, we can see we have a command that is typed in, so to speak, seven bytes long, and it says, welcome. All right, so we're going to write this to disk in just a bit. Now, whenever CPM gets loaded into memory, the command processor will already have a command in that looks like you just typed it, a seven character command that says welcome. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that will then ex uh, execute our welcome program. Now, there's a bit of a problem here, and that is that there's a couple of situations in which the command processor is reloaded. One would be the cold start, like when we just boot for the first time, or if you've done a hard reset, pretty much like you expect. However, it also gets reloaded and would execute this command every time a warm boot occurs. Now, a warm boot occurs over and over in a typical CPM session. A lot of programs exit by doing a warm boot. Uh, if you hit Control C, even at a command prompt, it does a warm boot. So depending on what your startup program did, you may not really want it running every time a warm boot occurs. So to get around this limitation, most implementations of CPM included some flags up in the BIOS that let you choose whether it loaded at cold start or at warm start, cold and warm start, or neither. So you may be wondering, well, how does the BIOS control whether the command processor runs a command? Well, the reason is because the BIOS actually hands control over to the command processor as the very last part of booting. And it does that by jumping to the entry address of the command processor. This gets, us, this gets us back to these two entry points that I mentioned earlier. This first entry point executes a command if it's present. If we jump to the second entry point, it ignores anything that's present there. So basically, based on those flags, the BIOS jumps to this entry point or the second one, depending on whether you want or don't want to execute the command. All right, now there's a uh, pretty common use, pretty common definition amongst most manufacturers in the BIOS of these flags, and it's called the mode byte. And there's a total of eight flags in there. Some are related to interrupts, some are related to disk drives, but the two related to cold start are pretty typical. Let's take a look at it in this BIOS. It's up at 25D9. Right now it's set for 1-0. That 1 basically says turn on interrupts after uh, disk I.O. is complete. The flags for cold start versus warm start are the least significant two bytes, so, uh, two bits, I'm sorry. So the ones bit says, do we want to run a command on cold start? The twos bit says, do we want to run a command on warm start or um, warm boot? So right now, these are both set to zero if, because those would be in the last two bits of the zero right there. So even if we save this with our command in place, because those flags are both false, the BIOS would enter the um, command processor and not let it execute our welcome command. So I'm going to set this to 1-3 that keeps our interrupt flag that was for the disk I.O. but also turns on both the cold start and the warm start flags. So we should see this message in both cases. Alright, so that's all we need to do to actually modify CPM. Let's exit the debugger. You can do that with a Go0 or a Control c Those are both a warm boot. Those are both the exact same thing. Now we're ready to do a sysgen. Sysgen writes what's in memory to the boot sectors on a, on a disk. Source drive name, if we say nothing here, it's going to use memory. We're going to write it to drive A. And that does it. Now it says um, enter destination drive name or return to reboot. This is not a true cold boot. This would just be a warm start. Anytime that you do a sysgen on the actual um, bootable drive, it's a good idea to do a hard reset. So I'm going to come over to the computer, do a reset, examine the bootloader at FF00, speaking in decimal instead of octal for a change, and hit run. So this reboots the computer from scratch. All right, so we've got our cold start, but look, auto run work. So our command, our welcome, which types that, ran just like we wanted. So it worked on cold start. To do a warm boot, all I have to do is control C. It's booting right now. There it is. And for example, some programs like pip. Pip is used to copy files. Um, I'm going to enter it here with no arguments, so it just goes to the command prompt of pip. To exit pip, you just hit return. It's doing a warm boot right now. There's our auto run worked. All right, so what we did worked. We have our program uh, executing on cold starts and warm starts. How would you modify this to be cold start only? Well, you'd have to repeat the whole process, including typing welcome in again, because um, MoveCPM is going to make a clean copy of, of CPM each time. 
So to make this easier, I wrote a utility, and I'm sure utilities existed like this back in the day. Um, to make it a bit easier, I called it Auto Run. It says, what drive do we have our floppy on? We're just going to do it on A. And here we see the different options we talked about. Cold boot, warm, cold and boot, warm, or neither. And the current option is three, run on cold and warm. Let's change it to one, which will be cold boot only. So the current command string is welcome. And it says return for no change. So we'll just leave it as it is. It says, okay, it's all done. Reboot your computer to, to uh, let these changes take effect. Now I go back to the front panel and do this. I'm the cheat. I can go in the debugger and just tell it to jump to the boot ROM at FF00. This is the exact same thing as going to the front panel and doing it, but I don't have to get up and move. All right, so we're still having this here um, on a cold boot. Let's do a warm boot. See, it doesn't happen now. So that worked. We got rid of that. Now, in uh, MS-DOS, we were used to things like autoexec.bat, an actual command file uh, that would run automatically. Um, CPM also has the ability to do command files. not near as powerful, but it, it's done with the submit command. And you give submit a file that contains CPM commands. So, for example, I've made a command file. The default extension is sub for submit. Um, and it has two commands in it. One is the stat command. Stat's just a standard CPM program. When you run that with no commands, it basically will tell you how much disk space is available on your disks. And then I also have it run our welcome program. So to run this normally, you say submit auto, and it assumes the dot sub. Now the command process is kind of slow, as you can see here. Um, so here's the command prompt. There's our stat. It's going to run it now. And there's our disk space. And now it's going to run the welcome. And of course, that just spits out the auto run worked. So that's equivalent to running a batch file in MS DOS. Let's make this our startup. So we don't have to have just one command. We could have a command file that had multiple commands. So we'll run the configuration utility we wrote. Still do it on A. We're going to leave it as run on cold start only. So return for no change. Current command, let's change that to be submit auto. It says reboot for these to take effect. Again, I'm just going to cheat and use DDT to jump to the boot ROM and reboot our computer. All right, so here's our reboot. And now, if we look, we see the slow process of a submit working. There's our stat. So as we power up, we see that we've got 74K available on our disk. And we get our welcome message. Up and running. And again, still we have Control-C. It doesn't do anything. Uh, just as we designed. So there you go. There's the auto start capability that's built into CPM. We can run a command line or we can actually run um, a batch file similar to what we would do in the MS-DOS days. Uh, but we can call it anything we want, not just, um, not just autoexec.bat. All right, well that does it for this video. Now the computer used in today's video is actually an Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer actually duplicates the look and the feel, the features and performance of a real Altair, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside, so you don't have to worry about damaging a vintage computer with uh, all these fun experiments we're doing. You can just get out there and run it and have fun. Be sure to visit AltairClone.com to learn more about this great machine.